So we begin. Lord, open our lips, and our, our mouth shall proclaim your praise. In 567.
Volume 1 of the Book of Common Prayer, and we will say in unison the Song of Zechariah. We're on page 91, Canticle number 16. And we'll say this together. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This is the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteousness in his sight all the days of our life. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Today's first lesson is from the book of Genesis, chapter 45, verses 1 through 15. Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be dismayed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant of earth. And to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here. But God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are more, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now his eyes and the eyes of my brothers Benjamin, see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Here ends the reading. The psalm that's appointed for today is Psalm 133, which is found in your prayer book on page 787. 
It's one of the shortest psalms in the book. One of the shortest chapters in the whole Bible. Page 787, Psalm 133. And we will say this responsibly. Yeah. Oh, how good and pleasant it is. When brethren live together, together in unity. unity, it is like fine oil upon the head that runs, runs down, down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, and, and runs, runs down, down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that, that falls upon the hills of Zion, for there the Lord has ordained the blessing, life forevermore. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Today's second lesson is from the book of Romans, chapter 11, verses 1 through 2a and 29 through 32. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our gradual hymn is number 654, Day by Day, number 654 in the Blue Hymnal. said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my father, my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into the pit. Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth 
proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went off to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not answer her at all. And the disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Thank you. So this is kind of a self-proclaimed prophecy that's going on because we have a canine friend in here today. First of all, let's talk about the first part of that lesson. Please remember that Matthew, the gospel called the Gospel of Matthew, is written specifically to a Jewish audience. And if you keep that in mind, you sort of see how this is shaping belief systems within the Gentile church as well as the Jewish part of the church. Yep. So the Pharisees weren't happy with what Jesus said, and is there anything new about that? No. In fact, in our own day, we watch the same kinds of political dynamics go on because sometimes change is just too hard. So what is the church to take from this first part of the gospel lesson? Well, it's sort of the idea that sometimes the rules serve us and sometimes they constrain us. And it's like when we finally hear in John's gospel, the last of the gospels written, that says two things you need to do. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That is more important than kosher. That's the radical thing that Jesus is now saying to the Pharisees and to whoever would gather. Now this is not going to be an easy concept. And if you understand that your whole life is about knowing rules and enforcing rules and interpreting rules, then if you throw the rules out the window, oh, uh, I think you're out of work. I think that that doesn't go down well. 
And then there's the second half where you're going to deal with a Canaanite woman. And remember, she's going to be unclean as far as all things are considered. And, and it's a woman that he's talking to as well. And that's, that's a specious kind of thing. It's kind of dicey. Yeah. So she says to Jesus, heal my daughter. And he didn't pay any attention. So she keeps yelling, and now she's made the disciples unhappy. They say, Jesus, do something. She keeps yelling at us. And Jesus said, <laughs> and I can't help but think, you see, I don't see Jesus in, in, the, in, the, in the role of, of being the rule follower. So, so he says, fine, um, but you know, I, I'm not here for her. I'm here for the lost sheep of Israel. See, so that's kind of a double hit as far as I'm concerned. First of all, it's sort of like saying that the Jews are lost. And the second one is just missing the woman when that hasn't been his, his modus operandi up to this point. And so the disciples are confused. Well, she's uppity and strong and thoroughly dedicated to her daughter and to her daughter's well-being and to her daughter's healing. So she said, look, you, you, you need to do this, and Jesus seems reluctant. And then she talks about sitting at a table and the crumbs fall, and she said even the dogs get those. She was willing to equate herself as below the table, just waiting for a little something to drop her away. And her insistence is like the, the, the person that needs help and goes to the neighbor and keeps knocking on the door and knocking on the door till somebody shows up and answers the door and helps. She's persistent. Jesus gets that. And he sees that persistence as an expression of her love and her willingness to sacrifice and to approach someone and say, I need some help. So there you have it. Jesus then says the amazing thing, oh woman, great is your faith. And the healing was accomplished immediately. Tenacity is something that we need to think about. It's right up there with resilience and endurance and hanging in there. And it's all right to make our needs known to God and be persistent about it. That's an okay thing to do. It's not an ask once, get an answer, and be done. If that were the case, then there's an awful lot of things that we would have not accomplished as a human race. That if we took no as an answer, and we stopped. Of what value? It makes me go back also to thinking about the first lesson where we have the great story of Joseph, who his brothers sold into slavery, and he ends up being kind of the exchequer of all of Egypt. He has visions saying that there is an awful, terrible drought coming. And he has them put away during seven abundant years, storehouses full of food and provisions for the hard years that have come. Their exchequer is a foreigner among them. And he has saved an awful lot of lives. And he was glad to see his brothers and absolutely unquestionably forgave them for what they had done. And then he asked them, please bring father to me so that I might see him myself. Tell him I am greatly revered and honored here. He was honored. The Canaanite woman was honored. 
These are the people that were seen as strangers and outcasts in each of their particular life situations. Wow. That leads me to think that maybe I need to consider whatever judgmental attitudes that still sit in me that are related to race and class and gender and sometimes even religious affiliation. How is it that I might see someone different from me as being the welcomed one? And the one that God has put in the situation to make a point for me or for others or for all of us. The stranger in our midst that just might be our salvation. Because that's what Joseph was for the Egyptians in this story. Huh. I think there's a lot to be learned from this. And I really don't think I need to state it any more obviously than that. But I will illustrate it with something kind of interesting that happened to me yesterday. I've been seeing a patient that's 94 years old, and to say she's curmudgeonly would probably the, be the biggest understatement I would make all week. If she answered me with more, with more than one full sentence, then I'd feel like she sort of yammered on. There are parts of her early life that were extremely painful and her niece was hoping that bringing in the chaplain would allow her to talk about some of that, including her father's extremely conservative religious outlook and this child that was withering in that system. Well, turns out she pretty much told her niece that she didn't want to deal with that sort of stuff. She was done. And uh, so with that in mind, then, you know, the, the patient asked that I not come back. That's okay. And so I didn't think about it much. But the niece and I got to talk about bereavement in general because she's, you know, she's standing watch over her aunt as her aunt is failing. So I sort of had in my mind that my patient was forgetful and moving through a stage of dementia and sometimes that can make you combative and difficult to be with. So the more that I talked to the niece, the more I figured out I was totally wrong. So I asked more about her history and she said, you know, my aunt never married, never had children. That made her kind of on the margins. The woman's 94 years old. She was a young woman during World War II. She was extremely athletic, and so, with that, she played professional baseball when the baseball teams went to war. She was also a professional wrestler. Okay, I'm seeing this woman, she's about this big. And she was a professional wrestler. Well, that explains some of it. And so I said, tell me more. Oh, well, she went on and, 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 and uh, struggled, and, and as she pulled away from the family, she uh, decided she wanted to be a nurse. So she put herself through nursing and then got a specialty in psychiatric nursing. And then she worked at Vacaville and worked with some of the most hardened and tough criminals that have come through the system since Alcatraz closed, including serial killers. And right up to this day, she will not even talk about that because she said, I'm sorry, that is private information from me being a medical professional and so I won't talk about it. Even though her daughter was writing, uh, or her, uh, rather her grand, grand niece? Grand niece was writing a paper in college because she was going to, to go into psychology and she wanted to talk about the psychology and some of these people, if I named them to you, are extremely famous prisoners, notorious, and she said, I'll talk about anything that happened as a psychiatric nurse in that situation 
except I will not talk about this one, this one, this one, and this one. Well, of course, the great niece wanted to talk about that, that, and that, and that. She says, I won't do it. That's private information. And it deserves to be kept that way. Then I find out that she reads page through page of the, the, the San Francisco Chronicle every day, and she has political opinions, which I heard about while I was there. And I had to look at her with, with great respect and a great understanding of how she had made a life for herself, doing things differently than everybody else. And I just pigeonholed her as one more, and I got my comeuppance, and I found out what an incredibly cool human being she is. And I'm sorry I don't get to go back and visit with her, because she really is cool, and I'd love to hear the stories. The baseball, the wrestling, the nursing school, all of that stuff. So we all fall into pigeonholing people for one reason or another. And I'm guilty of it myself. So I'm not proud of that. But I'm proud of the possibility that I can do better next time. And not take for granted what my eyes and ears think that they see and hear. And while we go through all of this, you know, I, I got to thinking about life since November has been tough for us. Not just the St. Edmunds people, but people in the world at large. Um, you know, California tried burning down in November. And we went without power more than once. And then things came rolling around with COVID. And then it was the illness and it's unrest and it's all of these things are bubbling to the surface that we've sort of looked at and said well, yeah you know okay fine and sort of had an idea of what that meant and how we were part or not part of that and and it's just like me looking at my patient and just sort of figuring this gives us all an opportunity to go back and think through how we can be like Joseph and even if we're seeing ourselves on the margins, what can we do to be thoughtful and compassionate and hardworking and gentle and really good planners? Because he was certainly that. How might we be like the Canaanite woman who goes up to Jesus and said, I want my daughter healed. Nah. Well, I'm going to yell at your disciples. Would you take care of her? Get her out of our hair. See, then dismissed her. But then Jesus turns and says, your daughter is healed. Because she was persistent. So no matter where we find ourselves, there is a way that we can find ourselves inserted into all of the bubbling morass that is life as we know it right now. There's some obvious things. Social distancing, wash your hands, wear your masks, you know, the general stuff. There are ways that we can contribute financially without leaving home to help folks. And speaking of persistence, they're talking about reopening the payroll protection program. <laughs> and yes, I will apply again because I'm thinking at some point in time I'm going to ask long enough that somebody is actually going to give us some money and she will be healed and, and I will be healed <laughs> or released from the obligations of the promises <laughs> but it pays off this attention to how we see and hear and experience people and the willingness to understand that our judgments are sometimes wrong and sometimes that door has to open wide in our hearts. In our hearts. 
So I pray for us for that this week, that we find ways to understand that it's not only the vile things that Jesus talked about in the gospel lesson that come from the heart, but also graciousness, kindness, compassion, action, and love. Those are also part of our heart. Amen. Amen.
Jennifer and Tom, April and Amitaba, Marnie and family, Antonio and family, Jill, Joan, Joseph, Rosianna, and grandkids, John Arthur, Beatrice, and Lincoln, Nick and Michael, the local homeowners association, and Patrick. We pray for Dick T, Sarah, Ruby G, the Long family, Shirley L, Jim, Catherine, Tuffy, for Karima, Trina, Christine, Joe, Darlene, for Papa Joe, for Gail, for Kathleen HK, for Nick G, for Dave, Evangeline, Sophie, Diane T, Kevin G, Lucille S, Vanessa, David, Sean, Chuck, for Sarah and Jane, Lori C, Angie and family, Janine and Pat, Michelle R. For Jean, Joan, Jackie R. For Cara, Dan, Will, Peter, Dalton, Pamela and family. For Jackie B, Roche, Erica F, Jackie C, Danny F and Ben B. For the repose of the soul of John Lewis, for Joe and Michael, for Carol, for Reverend Stacy, for Jane, for Brad and Barbara, for Robin A, for Barbara and family, for Father Joe and Paula. God of truth. Inspire with your wisdom those whose decisions affect the lives of others. That all may act with integrity and courage. Give grace to all whose lives are linked with ours. May, may we serve, serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. God of hope, comfort and restore all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May, may they know the power of your healing love. Make us willing agents of your compassion. And, and strengthen us as we share in making people whole. We pray for ourselves and our ministries. Lord, you have called us to serve you. Grant that we may walk in your presence, your love in our hearts, your truth in our minds, your strength in our wills, until at the end of our journey we know the joy of our homecoming and the welcome of your grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us pray as our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we continue on page 98, in the Book of Common Prayer, with the suffrages, section A, Alpha A. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let our way be known upon earth. Your saving help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten nor will the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And on page 101, please recite with me the prayer of general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all who you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. For the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray. Give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Okay, so now it's time for announcements, and if the government actually says they're going to try to give away that last couple of billion dollars, uh, I'm going to try again, but I'm going to use a different bank, and we'll see if that helps. Um, <laughs> You know, I can only bang my head against the wall for so long until there's a, either a dent in my head or the wall. Um, probably the wall. So um, we will continue apace. Um, I have heard no news from the diocese that we're anywhere near planning to come back into um, the space for worship. And so I'll let you know when, when that seems appropriate. Um, and we get the thumbs up to do that. Um, Rest assured that we're going to come through and thoroughly clean the place, and and it will be ready for you when it, when it's time. Um, I am hearing in other denominations that they're really not planning for anything until the first of the year, so I'm not going to sugarcoat it because that doesn't seem to do any good anyway. So just letting you know that it may be four or five more months before we even consider being back in this worship space. Um, uh, suffice it to say, I miss you and we miss each other and, and hope you can join coffee hour afterwards. Um, and if you don't have a, a copy of the link, uh, just send off a note to, uh, to Dan and he, he will give you the logon information for the Zoom so you can join us for coffee hour. It's really been great discussions, and we've almost wished we had a couple hours to do that. Um, we get into everything or anything. So um, I think that's all I have for, for right now. Okay. Um, well, I, I, this is just a short announcement. I feel obliged to say this just because of recent events. The U.S. Post Office is not the enemy. So just kind of think about that, and uh, sure. whatever whatever you decide to do, it's fine. But we, I encourage everybody to go out and make sure you can vote early, uh, since this will be a crucial election coming up in November. 
And that's, that's about all I've got for now. Do you have something, Ruby? I do, really quickly. I forgot to add that to our prayer list, but I, I heard from Darlene Ross that uh, uh, Deacon Anna Nielsen Powell uh, is, uh, is ill. She has pneumonia and she had asked for our prayers. Anna was uh, one of the people who was here with her family when Douglas and I many, many years ago uh, came to St. Edmunds and she now is living in Chico. Um, she was ordained deacon, was she not? Yeah. Yes. yes, she was. And this was the congregation that was her sponsoring parish. Right? Yes, that's right. And yeah, her husband were yeah. She served here for a while. Uh -huh. yeah. Terrific. Yeah. I understand that, that uh, she's got to go home. She's gone home. Oh, good. And, and she's in, in recovery. So um, so, so we, we'll continue prayers for honor. Absolutely. Okay. You haven't told your story, but it's a couple of hours and the room is there for a while. Oh, sir. Uh, 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 Okay. All right. So, with that said, and thank you, Ruby, for that uh, for that nudge and reminder. Um, did anybody get a hold of any of you concerning uh, birthdays and anniversaries by chance? I haven't, I haven't heard from anybody. Remember, you can send in the information for birthdays and anniversaries, and we will commemorate them uh, in, in worship. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Mm -hmm. Our closing hymn in the Blue Hymnal is number 470. In the Blue Hymnal, number 470.
to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.